Welcome to part one of Chemistry and Biology, Atoms and Molecules. In this lecture, I would like you to be able to define atom, isotope, element, molecule, potential energy, kinetic energy, polarity, hydrogen bond, solute, solvent, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. If you are not familiar with the terms proton, neutron, and electron, these will also be things you will need to define. Name different elements in the periodic table. Compare different types of energy and different types of bonds. Identify whether a molecule is hydrophobic or hydrophilic based on the type of bonds and atoms in it. In class, we will have a discussion section. This is absent from this online lecture. First up, atoms. An atom is a single unit unit of an element, and an element is a pure form of matter that cannot be broken down into a simpler form. Take, for example, water. We would say the four elements, earth, air, water, and fire, well, not so much. Water in itself can be broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. These are what we call elements in science. A single unit of oxygen is an oxygen atom. Within that atom, we have three components. In the nucleus of the atom, which is in the center, there are protons and neutrons. A proton is a positively charged subatomic particle. A neutron is a neutral particle found in the nucleus. Surrounding the nucleus is a cloud of electrons. These are negatively charged particles that go around the nucleus and will be used to make bonds between atoms. We classify the different elements in something known as the periodic table. As you can see, we have an atomic number for each element. This atomic number is the number of protons that are present in the nucleus. There is also an element symbol, which we use to designate what the element is if we're making a formula of multiple different elements, such as H2O means two hydrogen and one oxygen. Then there is the atomic mass. This is the average mass of an atom. Now I say average because we have different numbers of neutrons in the nuclei of these atoms. Those are something we call isotopes, and we'll get to those later. So on average, an oxygen atom will have 16, an atomic mass of 16, which means eight protons and eight neutrons. Now we don't have to memorize this large periodic table because in biology, we only look at certain elements, primarily carbon, C, hydrogen, H, oxygen, O, and nitrogen, N. There are some things we need to think of like iron, which is Fe. This is something you'll find on a nutrition label because we need iron. We also need calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. We're going to spend some time in sodium and potassium later on when we cover neurons. Now we also see here that there is a number of bonds that a single atom can make. And this becomes more important than the number of electrons it has when we are dealing with bio biological molecules. So let's discuss isotopes and ions. We have an atom. Now this atom can come in some different forms. If we add a neutron, this is something called an isotope. So you may be familiar with carbon dating. Carbon dating looks at the ratio of different carbon isotopes in a sample found in an archeological dig. This is because the isotopes have different numbers of, of neutrons in them. And over time, these isotopes will actually decay because, well, radioactive decay is something for another topic. But suffice it to say, different isotopes have different stability, which is more of a chemistry thing. And different isotopes have different numbers of neutrons. They have, however, the same number of protons. If you change the number of protons, you have a different element. Adding or subtracting an electron results in an ion. And we are going to see positively charged sodium ions pretty often in biology. This means that that sodium atom has lost 
one electron giving it a single positive charge. We would call that a cation. Something that has gained an electron would be called an anion. These are the two different types of ions, whether it has an extra electron or has lost an electron. It is possible for some molecule, for some elements to lose multiple ions. So calcium, for example, sorry, multiple electrons. Calcium, for example, can lose up to two electrons, making it a plus, a plus two cation. Molecules are groups of atoms bound together by types of bonds. And this can be something as simple as H2O, which is two hydrogens and one oxygen forming a water molecule. The combination of bonds creates something called chemical potential energy. This is why something like sugar can be broken down. And as we break those bonds, we release energy because you have potential energy in the sugar molecule. Let's talk about conversion of energy for a moment. Energy is in two forms. You have potential energy, which is the ability to make things happen, and kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. If I hold something up high, I have increased its potential energy because it has more energy to make something happen. For example, a reservoir of water at a high elevation can be used to turn turbines as it goes down and loses potential energy and the motion of that water moving is kinetic energy. We can turn that into electrical energy, but electrical energy is not what we're discussing in biology. The kinetic energy, in fact, uh, we discuss in biology is the energy of, say, an organism moving, like this child here. If you give a child sugar, which is a molecule that has chemical potential energy, and the sugar molecule is broken down, you can convert that into the energy of motion. And in the lecture about metabolism, we will discuss exactly how. Kinetic energy can also be a measure of heat, which is just the motion of molecules. So when the air temperature goes up, that just means the molecules in the air have a higher kinetic energy. Now, electrons in an atom also have energy. They have potential energy. And electrons are capable of moving from atom to atom to form ions. We can also form bonds between atoms. So sharing electrons is called a covalent bond. And we see this again in water. It has two single covalent bonds in which both hydrogens share an electron with, water, with oxygen, which is sharing two electrons, one with each hydrogen. Why do they do this? It's because each level of electrons, called an electron shell, is most stable when it has a certain number of electrons. The first shell wants two electrons. The second shell wants eight electrons. Now, a single oxygen atom has six electrons in its outermost shell, and thus that shell is more stable when you put two more electrons in it. A single hydrogen atom has one electron in its outermost shell, and it's most stable, that shell is most stable when it has two electrons in it. So if each hydrogen shares one electron with an, with an oxygen atom, each, each hydrogen will have two electrons in its outer shell. If an oxygen atom shares two electrons, one with each hydrogen atom, it now has eight electrons in its outermost shell, and therefore it is at its most stable. You can also just take electrons, and this forms ionic bonds. Like two poles of a magnet, cations and anions are attracted to one another. If a sodium atom loses an electron and gives it to a chlorine atom, now the sodium atom will have eight electrons in its outermost ring because it loses a ring when it loses that single electron. The chlorine atom had seven electrons in its outermost ring, and by gaining one electron from that sodium atom, it now has eight electrons in its outermost ring and is thus more stable. Both of these will have a charge, the sodium cation, a positive charge, the chloride anion, a negative charge. 
and they will be attached to one another in a crystalline structure we call salt. Bonds do not always share molecules equally. Think of one of these electrons like, say, a fire truck that you've given to your child. This child will share it with the other child in the family, say a younger brother, but he won't share it equally. So there will be more time that the first child has a fire truck and less time that the second child has a fire truck. In the same way, an electron does not need to be shared evenly between two atoms. In water, the oxygen atom takes the electrons a little more often than the hydrogen atoms, which means one side of the water molecule has the electrons more often than the other side of the water molecule, giving it a more negative charge. This makes for a polar bond, and polar bonds means these are polar molecules. Certain elements like oxygen, chlorine, and nitrogen tend to form polar bonds. Other atoms like carbon and hydrogen will less often form polar bonds. So when looking at a molecule and asking if it's polar, look for oxygens, nitrogens, and chlorines. Hydrogen bonds are weaker than ionic. This is the positive charge of the water molecule being attracted to the negative charge of another water molecule. And we can see that these positive and negative charges on each side can be attracted to anions and cations and will actually surround them, making these anions and cations more stable in a water solution than they were in as a salt crystal. Hold up, what's a solution? Well, a solution is made of two things. A solution is made of a solvent, which dissolves things. This is something like water. Water is a good solvent because it can dissolve things like salt. A solute is the thing that is being dissolved. So in this case, salt is the solute. Together, the water and the salt or what we would call salt water, is the solution. Now we see this in water quite often, and you should know that water is essential for life. It is an excellent solvent. A lot of things can be dissolved in water. It is liquid at body temperature, and it is liquid for quite a good range. Water is very good at absorbing and holding heat. It has a high energy of vaporization, meaning it doesn't very easily turn into a gas and water can participate in chemical reactions, something we will see as we move forward in metabolism. Hydrogen bonds are what is making water so awesome. Water vapor has no hydrogen bond interactions. Liquid water has hydrogen bonds which cause what we call surface tension. It's why you can float some things on top of water because they're pressing down on those hydrogen bonds. Ice has hydrogen bonds that create a structure that make it have a lower density than liquid. This means when a lake freezes, it freezes over as the top becomes solid, but the bottom stays water, stays liquid. If you had anything but water, the top would become solid and it would sink, thus accumulating ice at the bottom, which would be very bad for the fish there. So this is one reason water on Earth has been so good for life on Earth but not everything dissolves in water. In fact, we have a whole term for things that do not dissolve in water. And these, this is hydrophobic. This means it does not dissolve in water, like say the oil in this Italian dressing. And that is something that is often nonpolar molecules that do not dissolve in water. Hydrophilic, on the other hand, dissolves in water. And that is usually something that is a polar molecule or an ionic bond. So would salt dissolve in oil? Oil is nonpolar. Salt is ionic bonds. Therefore, it would not dissolve in oil. Salt would dissolve in water because it, would, it is hydrophilic. At this point in class, we will cover something called the muddiest point. You can feel free to email me whatever you thought the most confusing concept was in lecture, and I will be glad to answer or address your confusion. Thank you.